here. I think we finally have it all together. I'm going to try to finish my little spiel in less than eight minutes. We'll see how that goes. So welcome, everyone, to the first webinar of the 2015 IGNIS series. And we are so very glad and happy to have you all join us today. And Jennifer's done a great job kind of introducing you to each other as you logged in. As a reminder, IGNIS is the Latin word for spark or ignite. And that's what we're hoping to do today is to ignite your curiosity about teaching and learning. This series is brought to you by SBCTC eLearning and ATL. And um, some of you have been in the room for a while. You already know my name is Alyssa Sells. I am an e-learning program administrator at the State Board for Community Te and Technical Colleges in Washington. And my counterpart is Jennifer Wetham. And she is also a program administrator. And um, she works with faculty professional development. So you might have heard of of us referred to as the dynamic duo or the wonder twins. I think Allison tweeted us as super twins, so that's a new one. Um, we got lots of good nicknames going on. We're two sides of the same coin. Um, I work more with um, e-learning faculty professional development, while Jennifer deals more with assessment and teaching learning issues. Also joining us today is our new collaborate rep. So um, his name's Rod Kennedy. And please um, help us welcome him to the SBCTC team. And I'm not sure, I think Amber's already stepped away. But our former rep, Amber Goulardi, she'll be um, back and joining us a little later. So um, thank you to both of you for taking time out of your day to attend this for us. We're also very excited to, we're so excited to offer this webinar series to you. And um, we really have a great lineup of presenters for you this season. We have not posted those yet, I don't think. Jen, have you gotten those out yet? Uh, well, not yet, but it's not just coming. Yet. Yeah, we'll get those out so you know what's um, upcoming. And then at the end of this webinar, uh, we'll tell you when the next day, date, and time is so that you'll know uh, when to log back in and catch us again. I'd like to take and this opportunity take our, to personally. Go ahead. I was just going to say, and if you fill out the survey at the end of the webinar, it has all of the future webinars on it, too. Oh, good. OK. So I'd like to take this opportunity to um, thank our fabulous presenter, Allison Andrunas, for sharing her expertise, her humor, and her knowledge with us today. And to also thank all of you, our participants, for um, attending this session. I think you're really going to enjoy Allison. Um, she's one of my favorite people. Well, you're all my favorite, but I do love Allison, I have to say. So uh, we'll let Jennifer introduce her in just a minute. This session will be recorded, and you will be able to access the recordings on the ATL blog. And let me see if I can get that into the chat window for you there. Um, so later, when we get our recording link, that will get posted. Uh, if you have any trouble finding it, uh, please feel free to email one of us, and we'll get that to you. And feel free to share the links with friends and colleagues that may not have been able to attend today. So um, this afternoon, we're going to get started by running through a few Collaborate tools and doing just a few quick group activities. And then we'll have uh, Jennifer introduce, um, formally introduce Allison to everyone. So we are here today for my decade of mistakes. And um, I can't wait to, to hear what Allison has to say. Uh, let's make sure everyone is set up before um, we get going. Hopefully, you've all had a chance to test your audio. If you haven't, um, please click on uh, the Audio Setup Wizard in the Tools drop-down menu at the top uh, left of your screen. And you can run that. So if you want to use your um, mic later, we can hear you talk. And funny thing, um, you know, learn as you go. I just noticed that I set our timer for seven hours. So you guys are in for a real treat. I'm going to talk forever. OK, so a little bit about our meeting interface. Um, here you can see the different pieces. Uh, you have your whiteboard. That's the big blank white space in the middle. Right now, that's where you see our meeting slides. There's a skinny little toolbar in between the whiteboard and the rest of um, the items on the interface. And we're going to use that toolbar in just a second, so kind of keep in mind where that is. Top left is the audio video screen, where you can see pictures of the people who are talking if they have a picture. Um, I see that mine is um, showing my camera right now, I think. So hello, everyone. And 
Right below that is the participants panel. You can see where um, who all is here. You can scroll through that and see who's attending. And then on the bottom left is the chat window, and we will be using that in a little bit as well. You can feel free to type questions in there as we go. All right, some of the participant tools you'll want to be familiar with are um, the emoticons on the upper left. There's smiley faces, and you can give applause, and that's just a little drop-down menu. So um, if somebody says something great or does something great, you can give them a smiley, like I've just done here. If you look right below my name, you can see a smiley face. And then um, there's a step away button. If you need to step away, you can turn that on, and we'll know that you've stepped out of the meeting for just a second. You can raise your hand if you'd like to speak. There's a polling tool, that little check mark. We will be using that here shortly, uh, so kind of keep your eye on that for a second. There are some permissions there. You can see what you can and can't do as a participant. And then there's also um, a microphone. It's a blue microphone. It's the talk button or the talk icon, and you can tell that your mic is on and that we can hear you when that displays next to your name. All right, so here's our chat window. You type into the bottom dialog box here, press enter, and your message will um, go to the group. Uh, we're in the main chat window now. There's also a private chat for moderators, just in case you ever need to moderate your own session, you'll know that that's there. And um, our whiteboard tools, I mentioned this pointer tool a minute ago. I'd like you to take just a second and locate that. You're going to hover over the toolbar. It's that skinny, skinny little menu right in the middle. And um, that will, as you hover over, it gives you, I think, a description of the tools. If you click and hold on the sun icon, um, you can select a pointer tool. And go ahead and do that now, because on the next slide, we're going to do something with that. And if you want to practice on this slide, please feel free to go ahead and um, give it a try real quick. So I'm going to grab the smiley face. Oh, you guys are awesome. Look at all those pointers. Yay. OK, you guys are ready. OK, next activity. Um, we're going to use that pointer tool again, and you're going to tell us where in Washington you are. And I know that we have um, some people outside of Washington, so um, we thought it'd be kind of fun if you just put yourself somewhere interesting on the map, because all of your states aren't shown. So if you want to be swimming in the ocean, or if you want to be on a state border, or if you want to be outside the page, go ahead and do that. And then um, if you want to type in um, where you're at um, into the chat, please feel free to do so. Did someone just raise their hand? I heard it. Oh, that was my timer, maybe. Yes? I think Steve has his hand raised. Steve? Okay. It's kind of far down. I couldn't see it. Oh, oh no worries. Go. Steve, yeah, go ahead. Steve, did you have a question for us? Um, I, I don't think so. I think, I no. think yeah. Okay. yeah. Jen, you want to go ahead and clear, the, clear that? I'll clear okay. it. OK, we've got a good group. Um, I'm in Everett, so just put myself in there. Hopefully I got it. I can't quite see where I am. So um, that's always a fun activity uh, that we do. Maybe we're going to have to expand our map a little bit since we've got um, lots of people outside the system today. I think we are. Yeah, I think we might need to get a bigger map. Happily, happily yes. so. Yes, yes. OK, our next activity is to do a poll of the group. And you're going to need to find that polling tool. It's a little check mark. And just on the drop down menu when you hover over it, click yes or no. Um, yes, if you've made a mistake as an online teacher, and no, if you haven't. I'm kind of thinking we're going to have a lot of yeses. Just hoping that we're um, all in good company here, right? <laughs> all right, uh, let me publish our polling responses here. OK, so um, looks like we've got a few no's, um, but we do have quite a few yeses. Steve, I see your hand up again. Did you have a question? It looks like he has. he's using the iPad app, and so he oh, can't see okay. the tool. And so, okay. Rod, I'm wondering if you could post something to Steve in the, window, uh, in the chat window, if that's OK? 
And then um, if you happen to answer yes to this polling question, in just a few minutes you're going to have an opportunity to share about what some of those mistakes might have been. And we're going to do that uh, using a collaborative group document. So um, that's the new experiment that we're trying this time is um, using a Google Doc along with our presentation. So that, that will be interesting here in a sec. All right, um, when we get to that activity, all you need to do is click the link that will appear in the chat window. Uh, it'll be down on the lower left. And oops, I see I didn't change the word polling there. That should say uh, click the link. Sorry about that. Um, that link's going to open a docu the document. Uh, it's a Google Doc, and it's going to open it in a new tab in your browser, so um, from there you can just type and contribute to the document, and I think Allison's going to give you a little bit more instruction on this um, when she gets to that within her presentation, but we just wanted to let you know that that was um, coming up so that you weren't super surprised. And then when you're done typing into the document, um, you're just going to click on the purple collaborate icon in the taskbar at the bottom of your screen um, to get back into collaborate. So um, hopefully you'll all be able to uh, figure out how to flip back and forth. And I see that I also need to proofread a little more because that says PF instead of of. All right, so just a little bit of meeting etiquette. Um, we like to have participants raise their hands when they'd like to speak. This just puts you in the queue and helps us know who to call on and in what order. And we love it when you guys use emoticons and let us know, um, like clap the hands if, if, you know, Allison says something fantastic that you totally agree with, give her a smiley face, whatever. Um, but do use those because it's a fun way to participate without actually um, having to interrupt and actually say something. Also, that talk button, if you are going to use your mic and you've raised your hand and asked a question and we call on you, go ahead and click your talk button. And when that button is clicked and talk is on, then we will be able to hear you, um, but when you're done, please go ahead and click the talk button off because we can hear everything in the background usually, dogs barking, telephones ringing, all that kind of fun stuff. So turn that talk button off when you're finished speaking. And then um, please type your questions into the chat window as we go, and we will revisit those when we get to um, the Q&A part portion of the session. And we're just going to let Allison present and um, let her get on a roll and keep going. So we'll save our questions to the end. And with that, it is time to turn it over to Jennifer to introduce Allison. All right. Um, thank you, everyone. And I'm, I'm seeing that a lot of people are just joining us, and so I want to say welcome to you. And um, I'm going to take a few minutes to just introduce Allison Andrunas. As you can see her, she is the Director of E-Learning and Instructional Design at Everett Community College. And in 2014, Allison was nominated for the George Shue um, Outstanding Exempt Employee Award, and I just want to read uh, one of, uh, a line from her nominator. Allison has changed the landscape for e-learning and beyond. As soon as she was selected for the director of e-learning, many of us gave a sigh of relief. Someone who is totally committed to excellence in instruction could now lead our technology program. No matter what the question, the issue, the confusion, the frustration, Allison manages to find a solution, or at least a bright light at the end of the tunnel, and does so with grace and kindness. Um, there's a lot more, and if you find Allison on LinkedIn, which I highly encourage you to connect with her, um, you can read the rest of that nomination. She won the Exceptional Faculty Award in 2013 from the Everett Community College Foundation. And um, she does so much work for, she does so much service to the state and also to the Northwest eLearning Consortium. So she's very much a thought leader, very much a visionary. Um, she has done a ton of presentations. She co-facilitated our new faculty institute um, this fall and received rave reviews just over and over. Faculty were so impressed with her dynamic energy, her brilliance, her wisdom, her humor, which you will get a lovely taste of. And um, she, does, uh, she does webinars for NIFOD, the National Institute for Systems Organizational Development, 
um, for she's presented to our instruction commission. I just can't say enough about how fabulous she is. However, I am going to stop because I don't want to eat into her time. So Allison, we're really honored to have you kicking this off. Thank you for your leadership and take it away, sister. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I'm going to start. Allison, we lost your mic, I think. And, okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Yep, we okay. gotcha. Okay, perfect. Um, so uh, basically, I just wanted to put some emojis in there so that I can look at the chat later to know where I was. And I saw some of my ELC friends using some emojis. So those are my two favorites, the sunshine and the kiss. Um, and I'm going to um, I'm going to uh, collapse the chat, and Alyssa and Jen are going to moderate it for me. Um, I can't look at the chat and talk at the same time. So um, first of all, let me go to my my first slide here. Um, I want to thank Jen and Alyssa for this opportunity to lead off as the presenter for the Ignis series. It really means a lot to me. I. Um, I have learned that when I work with those two and I say, wouldn't it be great? They say yes at the same time and they make it happen. And what they're doing, for those of you that are not familiar with the state board system in Washington State, um, they do basically professional development on a huge scale. We have 34 community colleges in the system with wildly different cultures, institutional practices, demographics. And these two are tasked with the um, the monumental feat of putting together professional development, which many of you do at your own institutions. Those of you that are here today, I want to thank um, all of my ELC friends. Um, a few of you I know from Twitter. A few of you I don't recognize at all. And at least one of you, I get all of my best material for humor um, as inspiration. So I want to thank you for being here as well. And so um, first of all, um, oh, I want to let me go to my next slide here. Um, my ethos as a presenter is that um, I like a little chaos. Um, you have to love chaos a little bit with technology. And if you don't, then um, embrace it. Why not? Um, think of all the things that can go wrong. Like say you were practicing for your webinar and you spilled a glass of water on your laptop. Um, <laughs> that can happen. <laughs> you can uh, do the best of us. Um, so uh, put your water in a sippy cup and don't keep it near your laptop, uh, just as a word of advice. And the other thing is that I'm not a salesperson. If I don't believe in something, I can't sell it to you. So a few of you are my faculty here in my audience today, and I want to thank you for being here. Um, I really love working with you all, and um, if you know anything about me, I can't tell you something's a good idea if I don't think it's a good idea. So whether that's software, whether that's a teaching practice, uh, anything, if I don't think it's a good idea, I can't sell it to you. So that was the limit for me as a sales person. And I also like to bombard people with a lot of information. So I do talk fast. I will say that from the get-go, but this is recorded. You can go back. Um, I'm also happy to repeat myself. But I also believe in giving more resources than you can possibly use. And I think this is a strength of a lot of really good online teachers, is that you give everything you have, um, but you always have to let them know what, what is required and what is optional, because that's when your inbox blows up with uh, 5,000 emails about whether you have to read everything. So, okay, that's my ethos. And that being said, I wanted to try something a little different. I'm going to be doing this at a couple of conferences, and so I thought I'd give it a shot here. Um, and I want to start with a quick quiz. Number one, are you so comfortable with Collaborate that you could teach somebody else how to use it? You either say yes or no immediately. Do you multitask? Do you live to multitask? Number three, do you bomb chat windows with ideas when you attend webinars? If you answered no to any of these questions, stay here. Do not try to go to the Google Doc. Do not email Alyssa and Jen for help. Just stay right here. You can look at it later. Sip your coffee. Listen. Um, if you answered yes, 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 hashtag, I love it. Um, Alyssa will put the, um, the link to the bit.ly to my Google Doc, and hopefully that will come up. Um, for those of you using the Google Doc, maybe remember your cursor parking so that you can be aware of where other people are. And as I go 
go through each mistake, feel free to share your own horrors, um, your own resources. And basically, I'd like to create a document that we can use later. This is something that we tried at Northwest eLearn with Amy Robner, Lisa Chamberlain, Renee Phoenix, and Stephanie Bimmel helped us out by doing all the typing. And I've gotten so many people come back to me and say that that was so helpful to see what we did. And um, I'd like to say that Lisa, Renee, and Amy and I spent hours and hours and hours coming up with that idea. But I do think there was maybe a second or third beer involved when we decided <laughs> that we were going to do that. So now I'm going to be professional and say that we should try this uh, Google Doc in this situation. So, and if you are new to Google Docs or collaborative documents, just stay here and, and listen. You'll get more out of the event than trying to, to multitask. So, let me first start with a true confession. I would have never done this if I was still in the market as a faculty member. If I was trying to get a job this spring as a faculty member in the system, I would have never, ever, ever gotten on the internet for all time and said what I did wrong. And uh, that being said, we put a lot of pressure on faculty to be perfect, right? We only show what we do well when we get observed. It's our best foot forward. and. And that's a real tragedy because what that does is that that sets up a precedent for graduate students, for new teachers, that everything is just organically perfect. And I have to tell you, all of my great experience teaching has come from mistakes that I've made, risks that I did at the last minute. Um, uh, classes I was not prepared for walking five minutes into the door. Um, and so what I'm going to do today is share with you the mistakes that I did then, the mistakes that I did um, while I was teaching online, and give you some of the solutions that I would do these, uh, if I was still teaching right now. So basically it's a mindset that I would have revised um, had I known what I know now. And so um, I'm hoping that for those of you that are e-learning directors or work with professional development, I'm hoping that I can give you a resource so that you can take it to your faculty and say, look, you're really good and you're not as bad as she was. Or you're really great and you can be better this way. And, you know, I am a product of the system. I have several degrees from Washington State. I've, I went to community colleges in Georgia and California, and I finished my AA at Wacom Community College. I have a bachelor's and master's in English from uh, Western Washington University. And then I went back to school to earn my master's in education. And my, I connected with a writer on Twitter. Um, he put out a question, and I responded to him, and he interviewed me, and tells my story way more optimistically than I ever could. <laughs> I haven't let go of some of the rage and despair about not getting a job as a faculty member. I'll go into that a little bit more in just a minute. But um, what Josh put together is such um, an inspiring story. Um, my my tragedy as a as a day as a night um, a nighttime movie almost, um, and really made something kind of encouraging. So 10 years ago, um, where what I, what I did, um, I was in graduate school circa 2003, 2004, so a little bit over 10 years ago, and I got started teaching online. Um, I was a teaching assistant for a women in literature class, and my teacher tasked me with the moderating of discussion boards. So I got this 21st century experience as a graduate student where I got to see students who didn't say a word in class do quite a bit of talking. Um, on the discussion board, I got to write prompts. I got to summarize to the professor what the, what the students were doing, what they were thinking about. It was this amazing experience in hindsight. Um, and, you know, from the professor's perspective, it was great because she could go out and train for her marathon and she got uh, some time off. And I did a lot of the, the work and I was incredibly grateful for it. So I was in this program as an English major, um, getting an English uh, degree, and it was a very collaborative environment. Uh, we worked together, and then I got a job at community college. My first job was here at Everett Community College, and um, I did the training immediately, and I was very interested in teaching online, and I got an email one day from the scheduler, and it was pretty last minute, and he said, and I quote, we need people to teach online and no one else wants to do it. I'm getting desperate. Interested? That's all that I got. I wrote back immediately, yes, I would love to. I had no idea what I was doing. I had done the certification, um, and I knew very little, and when I asked 
for uh, information on what to do. I was just told to put all of my handouts online, write lectures to connect them. Shouldn't take that long, and you're a writing teacher, right? You can do this. Oh my gosh, who suffered more, me or my students? Uh, and I, I look back at those time, at that, at those first classes, and I'm actually grateful that we don't have access to Blackboard anymore. Uh, so I can't see what I did. It was really terrible. And what I did is I tried to get better. At that point in time, a lot of what was on the internet, via blogs, via articles, um, it was all the pretty and the beautiful. Um, everybody wanted to tell you how smart they were, what they did well, um, how fantastic they were. Nobody blogged about how they failed lecturing that day, or nobody tweeted about um, what they um, what they wish they had done in their class. There really just wasn't anything out there unless you wanted to look in the mirror and see all of your imperfections based on what was beautiful on the internet. And what I found as I was teaching is that I never got bumped. Um, and that's a euphemistic term for scheduling some adjuncts. You know this quite well. You, you get bumped when you're outranked, um, usually when that means that a full-timer's class isn't filled. And I found that I was never bumped. Um, nobody wanted my online classes. So it was great. And then I moved into teaching hybrid. And so at a time when I was watching a lot of my colleagues um, losing classes, especially around the time of the recession, I was fine. I had more work than I I could do, quite frankly, uh, teaching five and six online classes. Now, that's a clear path to a lucrative income, but it is also a clear path to insanity and a lot of dissatisfaction in life. I was very lucky in an unlucky era. It is very, very difficult now to get your foot in the door as an adjunct and as a new faculty member teaching online. A lot of online faculty are now the full-time faculty. They have taken it on. They've embraced it. They've been given sabbaticals. They've been given um, release time to do their work. But at the time I came into it, there was no funding to set up your work. You basically were the, you were teaching the classes that nobody else wanted. So if you are an adjunct right now, I've given you some advice on my Google Doc. You can check it out later, but I do think that this makes a difference. It's a small little difference, but I truly believe all new faculty, you need to have not only your philosophy of teaching, but you also need to have a philosophy of technology. So I shared mine with you that's three years old now, and it's a little dated, and I sound a little robotic, um, but you're welcome to listen to it as an example. And then um, I, as I was finding a great dissatisfaction with, with my adjunct situation, I decided to go back to school. And Washington State offers a tuition waiver. It has since been shipped away, and, um, and there aren't as many opportunities as there was when I first started. But I have the attitude that if you weren't going to hire me as a full-time faculty member at Washington State, you were going to pay for me to get another degree. And I was going to change my career. And at the time, I thought that I was going to leave corporate education. Going to leave higher education and go into corporate training and corporate education. And uh, as I'm sitting here today, I can tell you that that was not the path for me. And luckily at Everett Community College, I had people who championed my work. And uh, Jean Leader, my Dean of Arts and, and Learning Resources, she took a real chance um, on me and gave me an opportunity to try being a, the e-learning director. I had gotten a job as the instructional designer, and so um, it was a huge honor for me uh, to, to get this experience, and I, I do love what I do. So here's what it looks like now, right? Uh, feel free to laugh, e-learning directors. <laughs> so everything's so perfect, right? Um, notice those high heels. Notice how she's smiling. Um, I chose this because this was the earliest image I could find of somebody multitasking with computers. And let's just say she's not getting anything done. Um, and I, I really uh, thought this summarizes everything that, that I do. So what I do now is I coordinate a small team and I support faculty and students with our learning management system. I, um, I, I co-chair our open education resource the Alternative Textbook Committee, and I help with professional development, and basically anything that has to do with technology, I try to advocate on behalf of faculty. And so everything that I do as a, a director is informed on, uh, informed by my experience with teaching. And I had very little opportunity to reflect as a teacher. Uh, teaching five and six classes, it was about survival and trying to have a life on top of that. So 
in this job, I'm actually given some time um, when I'm thinking about strategic planning and thinking about various initiatives. I think about who I was and what I did. And my team, we went to the Center of Innovation down in Mohai in downtown Seattle, and they have this little time capsule, time capsule, and you can take a picture of who you are and what you wanted to do. So I thought I would do like a little scary stance that's there now for all time. And my next cool idea is trying to improve online education, and I, I truly believe that um, where I work right now and the people I get to work with, we're all on that same path. So um, this is how I use this a lot in my presentations because I feel like this gets to the heart of how faculty feel. This is, for those of you that don't uh, know U2, uh, the band U2 right off the bat, the, the, this Venn diagram here represents how I think faculty feel about educational technology right now. Faculty are bono, and the technology, they can live with or without it. And I feel that teachers are now being more and more pressured to use technology, and we are, and I, I mean we as in the system, um, are really doing as much as we should to support faculty because things are changing so quickly. Students are changing, uh, the technology is changing, the culture of education is changing, and so I feel like faculty are really caught in the middle here, and, um, and a lot of them do not like it, and they have that choice to not use it if they don't want to. A lot of full-time faculty have that luxury right now, but if you are a new teacher or if you were hoping to get tenure in some day, you cannot avoid technology. Um, and what we want to do, though, and what I would like to do and be a part of is how we can use the technology to be effective teachers. So. The English teacher and me can't um, resist a chance to talk about words here, and I wanted to originally title my webinar My Decade of Clubs, but I figured that would be hard on the marketing for Alyssa and Jen, so I went with My Decade of Mistakes. And so what I've done is I've used a little bit of the, um, a little bit of synonyms here throughout my uh, PowerPoint to show um, and to highlight how there are different forms of mistakes. And at the time, I didn't know these were mistakes. I was really trying to be a good teacher. I will admit there were times when I was not trying to be a good teacher. I was just trying to make money and survive and get through the quarter. Um, but there were times when I really, really tried to improve. Um, and so, you know, and, and honestly, I can track that when I look at my rateyourprofessor.com. You can see the smiley faces and the dissatisfaction. Um, the, I wasn't feeling particularly good about my career during those times either. So, um, and, you know, and also it's always nice when those students have, t have spelling errors too, right, when you see those. And where I started, this is, um, I, I like I like bikes, I'm a cyclist, and so I, I found this uh, bike in one of our art studios, and I thought it really symbolizes how I felt as a new teacher. All of my teachers, they were fantastic, all of my heroes, I mean, well, not all of my teachers, okay, I'm just going to tell you that. I had a few terrible ones, for sure, but all of my heroes, all of my teachers who I really looked up to, they all lectured. They wrote really long assignments, they talked a lot, um, and they gave me a lot of text to read. I was an English major, so that's what I had to do, but the truly great ones, they facilitated, and they led a really good debate, a really good text-driven debate, and that's what I loved, and that's what I loved doing. I loved facilitating a conversation, and so when I got to teaching online, I realized I had a lot to learn. There were, the party had already started, and I was getting there late, and I didn't have a bottle of liquor or anything to offer. I just was such a newbie that I had no idea what I was doing, and all of my strengths as a teacher disappeared. In the online setting, it was really difficult to tell jokes, to tell how people were doing that day, to talk about current events. Everything that I did well was killed by the online environment, and so I really struggled to get a, get a leg up on how to become um, a teacher that actually connected with my students. And basically all of my linear thinking that I brought from teaching face-to-face -face into online 
that was, it killed my creativity. You can't go from A to B to C in an online class and expect everything to line up the way that it does when you're in an 8 to 8.50 Monday through Friday class. Um, you can gauge how things are going. In the asynchronous environment, you lose so much of that control, and I was so unprepared for that. And this is something I would not have admitted, um, but now that I'm, and now that I'm administrator, I can honestly say that I made so many mistakes at a time when people thought I was doing everything right. And I'm not really sure how that how that happened. It must have been my numbers. It must have been what students said. Um, but what I did learn, and thankfully at that time, there were wonderful people on Twitter and wonderful people on the Internet sharing a lot of their work. In fact, a lot of you are in the audience today. You were my e-learning ed tech heroes. And here you are listening to me. I, I'm, I'm just shocked um, because you helped me understand what I needed to know. And so, one of the things that I found when I wanted to change my mindset is, is that I, the major oversight that I had is that I should have used open education resources earlier. I should have kicked my book to the curb a lot earlier. Now, things are a lot easier. There's a lot of content out there um, than there was just about this three or four years ago, um, or at least th that I knew of. Um, there was a lot of content out there, but it was really difficult to find, and we're getting a lot better at sharing those resources. But as an online teacher, um, I, I lost a lot of students at the beginning of the quarter because they couldn't afford the textbook. They, um, and so they couldn't go to the library and copy my handouts like I did for my face-to-face -face students. And so I, I won a grant, and that helped me work with uh, getting uh, rid of my textbook, but I really wish that I had spent more time working with databases and working with the Internet uh, rather than sticking with a textbook. And so one of the things that I, I, that was a mistake, but it really was a mind shift that I needed to, to make. And so what I needed to do is I really needed to be creative. And I did not allow myself to be creative. I was still in that linear mindset. So if you were looking to go OER or if you are getting interested in using open educational resources, you don't have to do it all at once. It's a tremendously big job. And so what you can do is try to take your course redesign in three or a three week or unit chunks. In one year, you'll have the entire course. That's pretty much how I did it. Um, I started with the first three weeks of my class because I was sick of my students not having the textbook. And then I would add, um, and then I, I would start on the, the next three weeks and so on. What I wish I had done was split the labor with a like-minded colleague and accept that we would compete against each other on the job market. So what? So be it. At some point, if you're an awesome online teacher, you are going to get snagged up in this system. And I live for the day when I can hire you. Um, but for right now, um, find that like-minded colleague. And you can connect with Jen or Alyssa or with me, anybody in this chat room right now, um, to find someone who is like-minded in your discipline and work with them. You can also find a really cool full-timer who is bored of a departmental drama. Go to a department meeting and look at the person who looks the most irritated and then go and talk to that person afterwards because I bet he or she, they are sick of the people that they are living out the same drama over and over again. So I hear. I'm not really sure that that happens, but I, it might. Um, ask your e-learning director to set up a Canvas course so that you can collaborate with other people. Right now, you can set up a master course where all of you create the content and then you can share it. You can have a repository. Some of you may already have that in your departments, and if that's the case, wonderful. But you can do that for sections. You can do that for English 101, Engineering 131. Film uh, 100, whatever it might be, you can have that space to collaborate and work with another faculty member. And I truly, truly wish I had done that sooner. And I wish I had used my librarians more. Um, that I didn't realize the value of, of a librarian in putting together my content until I started to support other faculty. My second mistake was that I didn't see teaching as an art. I work in a building now where I share a space with art teachers, with engineers, with chemists. And one of the things that I really enjoy about watching them and listening to them teach is that they talk about practice. 
They talk about, and I knew this, right? I was an English teacher. We write drafts before we get to the final draft, but I did not see my teaching that way. And I really missed an opportunity. And I also missed an opportunity to um, take work from other people and make it my own. I was very caught up in the idea of attribution and ownership. And quite frankly, that does nothing for us as teachers. All it does is create more work. And it does nothing for us as e-learning directors, too, for those of you who are the uh, directors in in this uh, in the audience, and one of the things that really struck with me that stuck with me as a teacher was that I had a student who said, you know, I signed up for your hybrid class because your online students really hate you, <laughs> and here I was using the same content and hearing this from a face to face student was a little devastating. Um, and then the following quarter, I had a student who took my online class and then took my face-to-face -face class, and she came up and shared with me midway through that she felt like we were closer in the online class than we were face-to-face. -face. And I didn't understand what that meant, and I asked her, you know, how do, what do you mean? And she was like, well, you know, in an online class, you and I did a lot of one-on-one. -on -one. We collaborated a lot with your content, and in this class, you know, there's just there's other people in the class. and it made me realize that, okay, wow, you know, this, this was a really one-on-one -on -one experience for her. And uh, for me, it, she was just, you know, part of the class. So it, I needed to unlearn basically everything that I had thought about how teaching works. And that was not, that was not easy. The, the second thing, uh, the second aspect of this um, is that I hoarded everything in the LMS. I was limited by the LMS, whether it was Blackboard, whether it was uh, Angel. I really did not use the Internet to its potential, and I wish that I had. And if I had it to do all over again, I would. So this tray right here at Seedlings, you can see that there's a section that didn't take, a section that didn't sprout. And I have a visual metaphor here for the way that we should think about teaching. Is that my little seedling here could be something fantastic for somebody else to grow, to expand. So I didn't value my own ideas enough. I really saw myself as isolated, as um, independently boring. I didn't think I had anything to offer to the discipline of online teaching, especially in composition. I felt like um, this really was a job that I was hired to do, and I did not feel like I was a scholar in the in the field. And it wasn't until I met my ed tech colleagues that I realized that I was so wrong. I had the worst perspective, and that I was actually one of many. And I learned this by establishing what's called a personal learning network. The acronym is PLN. Alec Koros uh, brought me to, he's a Canadian researcher in educational technology, and I took a MOOC. It's the only MOOC I've ever finished, by the way. Um, I, I decided to take a MOOC just to see what the experience was like. And it really taught me that there are people all over the world with the same concerns. And I realize that sounds like a giant platitude and a bumper sticker, um, but in teaching, that truly is the case. And the other thing that I didn't do as I was limited by the LMS is that I didn't show my students how I use the Internet. It really wasn't until I stopped teaching that, that very last year that I saw the value in showing the students how I use the Internet, what I do when I do a Google search, that it's okay to use Wikipedia, but you want to use the sources, not the quotes, and you definitely want to check. Um, and I didn't give them a guide on how to cut down on the e-flood. And I didn't think of my students as citizens. I thought of them as people that I was hired to teach. And I truly believe that um, I should have been more honest with my students. And I should have shared more with them my, um, my own struggles as a researcher. Again, just like I said, I wanted to show that I was perfect as a faculty member. I did the same thing in front of my students. And students are wildly appreciative, right? When they see that you make a mistake, um, it's amazing the things that they'll share with you to say, wow, you know, I thought I was the only one that struggled with that. And so because building that community in an online class is incredibly difficult. And my mistake number three here is they really are tied to the first two, the first two mistakes. This right here, this is an image of Whatcom Falls that is within walking distance of my house. Uh, I walk my dog by it. I see it a couple times a week. And, you know, I just get used to it. It's this beautiful place. And this summer, I realized as I was on a run that there were people that drove from all over the place to see this waterfall. And I take it for advanced. I take it for granted. And so the other thing that I took for granted is that I ignored 
the potential for community. I was bored, um, I was isolated, and all I did was complain about how bored and isolated I was ra rather than doing something about it. And I didn't see um, what I was doing well. I criticized, so for all the thorns, right, on the rose, if you will, um, all I felt were the thorns. I didn't see the rose. I didn't congratulate myself on what I was trying. Um, when I did, when I took risks in my class, I didn't give myself credit for what I did well. I criticized myself for what I did uh, wrong. And um, and that's because I didn't have a community of people saying, you know what, I did it too. Yeah, I, I was terrible at that too. I bombed, or this is what I did. And the other thing that I didn't do is that I didn't see how information was changing, how I was changing, how the internet was changing, and how entirely cool um, it was that things were changing, and that we couldn't keep doing things the same in education, and that I didn't know I was a part of it. So this next image, this is the Whoopsie Woodle tra uh, Trail on Galbraith Mountain. And um, as a mountain biker, I always stop at this place because you get a 360 view. You can see Mount Baker. You can see the San Juans. You can see the ocean. You can see Canada. You can see this huge clear cut, but you can ignore that. Um, <laughs> and basically, the thing that I would have said to my former self is to say it's OK someday to do something, just not today. Right? I, I can't do this now, but maybe Maybe I can work towards it. And I'm a big fan of taking one thing and improve it. You do not need to redesign your whole course every quarter. You do not need to do open education resources in three weeks. You can spread it out. Do it in one section. And always take the time to look around and connect with people that are like-minded. That's the one thing that I really regret. I didn't reach out to people whom I knew I would have something in common with. I just felt like that nerd that if I email Lisa Chamberlain in Walla Walla, if I emailed her, she was going to think I was so weird. When in fact, she's a best friend forever now. I missed out on an opportunity. And if you do one thing experimental, do it in one section. I did it in all six sections. And so one mistake was replicated six times. That may sound like a really obvious, obvious point. Um, but I see this a lot right now with working with faculty. Do it in one section as a test case and then copy it the next quarter. And then make a note of what's difficult and make friends with somebody who figured this out. I did this a lot in math classes. Um, I had made friends with the person who seemed to like math the most because I hated it. And what I did is I would help, I would have that person help uh, tutor me, help me get through the math. And I wish I had done that as an online teacher. The next thing, and to keep the point in time here so I can have some time for questions, the other thing that I didn't do is I didn't see my class. I'll just finish really quick, and then we can get to questions. Um, that I didn't see um, that I was giving students materials so that they could work on their own. In other words, I didn't exploit the students enough. I should have given them the yarn and let them create yarn bombs. For those of you that aren't knitters, um, there are people that create what are called yarn bombs. Uh, yarn bombs, and anytime I see them anywhere, I have to pull over and take a picture of them. Because it's an amazing use of art um, and, and, and yarn in a very public place. And you would have never thought to do that unless you saw it, uh, unless you were influenced by somebody else. So put your students to work. Um, they make check, checklists. They do things to help themselves stay organized. And um, I had a student once who shared with me her checklist. And I said, wow, can I use all of these? And I'll write you the best recommendation that you've ever seen for the rest of your life. And she gave me all 10 weeks of her checklist. And I used them. Um, and I used them until the day I stopped teaching English 101. They were that fantastic. Also, have them share their study guides. Um, I did not see the power of summary and the power of letting students create the content until I was just about to leave teaching. And I'm a big believer in using Jing to uh, Jing or a lecture capture Panopto um, to do a short recording of summarizing students' work. They really love hearing faculty uh, summarize their their words on discussion board to actually use them by name. This is something that you would do in a face-to-face -face class when you make eye contact or that you would call on somebody. It's just a really nice way to show that, you know, hey, I'm, there, there's actually a person here. I'm not just a robot trying to teach you. And share with them when they are making a new thought, right? If you, like, for instance, when you teach English and you go over the thesis statement over and over and over again, it's unlikely that you're going to learn anything new from a student, but you can be there to say, yeah, that was really exciting when I 
finally got it, when I finally saw that I needed a topic and a claim, um, this is what changed everything for me as a writer. And you don't miss the joy and fun of learning. And so somebody put a little sign, a little sun there. So um, I'm going to take that as a sign to thank you all for listening so much. Um, and here's my contact information, my blog. Um, I, I feel like a musician right now talking about my upcoming tour, but um, I'm going to be doing a lecture for the Everett uh, Humanities Center, um, and I'll be at the ATL Winter Retreat. The conference, um, I'll be at the Washington Higher Education Technological Conference. I'll be at NISOD and the Institute for New Faculty Development. So I would love to meet any of you in person. And um, I'm always happy to share anything that I've gone over today. If you want to know more, I will flood your inbox. So uh, I'll stop right here and take any questions from Jen and Alyssa, if there have been any, since I haven't been looking at the chat. And I want to thank you all so much. I hope that you found this useful. Thank you, Allison. Um, that was fabulous, and there was lots of comments in the chat about how great your pictures are, and also um, about uh, exploring sort of the concept of a personal learning network. It seems like people are really excited about that concept. Um, I'm, I've been keeping track of the chat, and it doesn't look like people have posted questions yet, so I'm just wondering if we could just give people a moment to either type, oh, um, it looks like we have a question from Taylor Holzheimer. Um, the question, synchronous classes versus asynchronous classes. Um, so I think what Taylor, Taylor, I think what you're asking here is um, if there's a difference between synchronous classes versus asynchronous classes. Um, oh, so Taylor is asking what works better. Okay, so, um, well, first of all, thank you for the, uh, those are my pictures from my cell phone. I guess I get lost, I'll tell you honestly, I get lost in looking for pictures on the internet. Um, I will spend hours, I, I will go down the rabbit hole on Pinterest and on the internet looking for the perfect image, and I didn't have time to do that. I just wanted to use images that I had on my cell phone, and some of them, I thought we could use some sunshine and some beauty here in the dark dreary. Um, it, it's not going to snow in the winter. I really don't like winter a whole lot, and so I'm most excited for spring. Um, but uh, so thank you. Um, but to answer Taylor's question, um, I I can't really say honestly what which works better. Um, I can just tell you that there it, it it's learner specific and it's discipline specific. So for instance, for me, I would never take a statistics class online um, because I need to suffer with people about math in a room with the expert who can see me almost crying, red face and sweaty because I don't get it. Um, that being said, I can take literature classes online and a lot of the humanities, and we have some fantastic STEM faculty that are doing some really cool things. Um, you know, we have chemistry um, from your kitchen online. We've got um, nursing faculty who are using flip design so that the students can do the, the work before they come to class so they can maximize the, the teacher experience. Um, so um, I can't say that one is better than, uh, oh, ha sorry, Bill. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I can't say that one is better than the other, uh, but I think that online education, and I truly believe this, that it, it gives people access to education that normally would not have had access to it. Um, I, I believe with 100% of my heart and soul in the open door policy of the community college, and I think that anything um, that we do, based from the, that Truman Commission, um, the online education uh, to me is that actualized t potential of the open door policy. People who can't drive here, people who are from far away, people who quite frankly um, can't afford to get here, um, and so this allows them to learn online. Um, I've taught myself to knit online. I've just been a part of um, the smallest federated wiki happening through Mike Caulfield and Ward Cunningham, and I learned more in those 14 days than I did in four years in graduate school, uh, and I'm not kidding. Um, and so I, I think that it depends on what you're doing and what you're learning. Now, do I want my brain surgeon to have done an all-virtual PhD on brain surgery? No. 
I want that person to have worked with real people and real brains. Um, but there's a lot of power, I think, to um, to having having the option. And right now, it's, you know, we say a lot about online education that it really is the wild west, and we need to figure it out. Um, and we are. And so maybe more of a, a blended learning is the experience that works best. So um, I would say, Taylor, the jury's out. But I would say know, know thyself as a learner and know what works for you. Um, and, um, and don't, um, and, and give, give the faculty a chance. Some faculty are doing some amazing things. Any other questions? Let's see, I know there was, I had to look away from the chat because it was, uh, people were uh, typing quite a bit. I think that Greg has a really interesting comment about feeling stuck in the rut of discussion forums and exams as the only types of gradable assignments that seem plausible. And he has a question if there's other ideas out there. Oh boy, Greg, could I, um, I could do a whole other webinar on this. Um, I, it's really, really difficult um, to, to foster that community and um, depending on what learning management system you're using, if you're using Canvas, there are a lot of tools that you can use that I'm most familiar with. I'm not, um, it's been a while since I've taken a look at Blackboard or uh, Angel or Desire to Learn, but um, I think that one of the things that I wish I had done was to use like a collaborative document, like what we're doing with Google Docs right now. Um, I would have used that a little bit more. Um, there's a lot of power in using a wiki. Um, I took a class where we were assigned to look up terms. And what we were supposed to do is bring our definitions of these terms. And then we met as a group. And we um, and this was all online. So we were all typing back and forth to one another. Um, but I think that if we can use other tools, like wikis or a Google Docs or um, even blogs, um, and you can keep the you know, uh, there, there, there are lots of things outside of the, the LMS that, that could work. Um, and, um, and also group work. Um, I know that it's very, very difficult to get groups to, to work online. Um, but I, I wish that I had done um, a little bit more in terms of getting students to uh, co-produce work. Um, and, and not in the same, not in the way that, you know, we do a group work and I'll take four slides, you take four slides, I'll take four slides, none of that. It, it really just putting together um, a collaborative document. Um, that's how a lot of us work these days. Um, if you collaborate with people in the workplace, you have to have that skill of being able to collaborate via the digital space. And I think as the tools improve, um, things will get better. But right now, if I take a look around at my colleagues or people that I find the hardest to work with, I would say they came through a system where it was all Scantron and all multiple choice and it was all black and white. Um, the people that I collaborate best with are the people that um, saw the value in writing an essay together or uh, copying and pasting and, uh, and, and, and really just trying to hash things out. Um, so um, I, I think that there, there's a lot going on in terms of looking at ways to get away from the discussion board because you know, the other thing that's really difficult, too, is um, how many times can you type your bio? Oh, my gosh. If I was asked to write my bio one more time in a class, I was going to lose it. I finally had a teacher who had us make a video, a little five-minute video. Hey, here I am. This is my dog. I like to snowboard. I like to mountain bike. And the students listened to those. And I think that what I witnessed in that class was um, a more engagement of who uh, people actually were. And things are easier now. Um, it, I would have never used some of the, the lecture capture tools um, and, or uh, any of the audio recording, but things like Jing, screencast, some of the audio tools in Canvas are, are a lot easier to use. And people are quite comfortable with using the video on their phones as well. So that's a, another, another option. I think we've got time for another question. Jen? So, Allison, we have one quick one and then one that might take longer. Um, and the quick one, I think, is can you recommend a good wiki product from Karen? Um, a good wiki product. Well, um, the the uh, federated wiki isn't ready yet for widespread use, but um, if you haven't heard of it, Google it. Uh, the the creator of the wiki, Ward Cunningham, as in like what is now the Wikipedia. He
he's working on a product um, that I, I think will be the future of, of, uh, of collaboration. For now, I use Wikispaces. I, I really like Wikispaces a lot. You get a free account as an educator, so use your .edu um, address. I'll add that to the Google Doc afterwards. Um, and once you're approved, um, you get a certain amount of space. And so what I do is um, I just delete uh, what, um, what I don't need to make up space if I haven't had to pay for it. But if it's something that you're using quite a bit as, as, as a teacher, you could all, um, I, would, I would recommend going to your department, especially if you're in STEM, baby, they've got money. Go to them and say, this is what I want to do with my, uh, with my class, and I, I, need, I need a membership for Wikispaces. Um, and there's also wiki tools within, within Canvas. And the thing to remind students is that nothing gets lost. You've got a record of everything, and you can find it. Um, and what was the second question? Um, there was just a question about have you pushed, asked students to use technology and share their results in an online class, such as videos or audios they have made, using t maybe using Twitter, or maybe even just using Google Documents and shred formats? If so, what were the results? Um, I did not use, um, I did use videos and I did use audios and I still use audio. I'm teaching a class right now to certify our new online teachers and today I just decided to make a video on here is what I did as um, in my first week of teaching and I highly recommend the syllabus quiz. You know, I got the idea from QM, uh, Quality Matters, and I also got that idea from my very first e-learning directors who um, it was Sarah Frizzell and Stephanie Delaney. So I was also very lucky. I started with uh, two fantastic e-learning directors. Um, so um, I, anytime that you can talk to students, um, I recommend it, but only if it's easy for you. If you spend hours and hours trying to figure out how to use the tool, don't do it. Um, stick with what you know, and then try to practice. Um, but if you're using Canvas, I think the audio tools are some of the easiest ones to use. Um, I have not used Twitter as a teacher, but I use it for professional development, and I have seen wonderful uses of Twitter where the teacher has the students tweet the muddiest point, so you create a hashtag for your class, so I would have hashtag Ignis, Feb 5, whatever, and then have the students tweet um, what their muddiest point was. Um, and if you don't have that technology, have them write it down on, on a post-it note and stick it on the door on the way out. Um, getting that feedback from students, are, it's really important. Um, and if you don't want to use Twitter, you can also do the same thing on, um, on a discussion board. You can ask them to post the thing they don't get the most. And if you get a bunch of, me too, I struggled with that too, I would like this on Facebook, then it tells you something. Um, and uh, as far as Google Docs go, um, I have used it a little bit with teaching, and um, the, the thing that became the hardest was um, not everybody has a Gmail account, um, and that gets very confusing. So what I recommend as the teacher is to start the document, and then like what we've done in this situation, just give it to people, and then they can type there. You will have some industrial industrious students that will create their own, and if they do that, then, then have them make you the owner of it so that you are in control of it. Um, I only say that just for classroom management issues um, at their there are times um, when people don't behave well on the internet, uh, you may have noticed. And as a teacher, um, I, I recommend having control of those, uh, of those tools um, just so that you know um, you have a, a record of, of what happened. Um, that's one of the reasons why when I very first started teaching, I, I didn't allow anonymous posts on discussion boards. And um, right now, I, I'm, I'm working with teachers quite a bit on this. Um, I, I think we need to redefine netiquette. In the era of the troll and in the etiquette and in the era of really bad behavior online by celebrities, you name it, uh, we, we really need to help uh, our students navigate what is professional in the digital space. So, uh, Ralph, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but my my tip would be to try one. Don't do Twitter, Google Docs, and um, and lecture capture all in one quarter. Do one thing and try it and see what works for you. I tried everything all at once, and so don't do that. Allison, thank you so much. And Alyssa, I think has Alyssa has thoughtfully prepared a list of resources um, for people. Alyssa, do you want to say a few words about this? 
Um, no, the resources are here, but I think Ellison also pasted them into uh, the Google Docs, so they're there as well. Just some interesting things that you might want to check out, some articles um, I thought were interesting that kind of went along with um, what Allison was saying. I think her mistakes that she mentioned were higher level. So, um, you know, top 10, top 11, top 9 mistakes, um, maybe these might be a little more granular and uh, a little finer. Points nice. um, than some of the big mistakes Allison was talking about today. Um, shout out to Quality Matters training that is available to faculty and staff statewide free. So contact your e-learning um, directors if you're interested in participating in that. And it looks like we ran over just a little bit today. Uh, so thank you for sticking with us. If um, um, Jen, could you paste the Google Doc um, link yep, back? Yep, I'm into on the it. Chat, I'm please. looking Thanks. for it right now. Okay. Um, in case anybody wants to contact us, um, here's our contact information. And um, Jen and I each have Twitter accounts. So um, mine's at Washington eLearning. Um, I only use it for work. There's no personal stuff on it. So it's just eLearning, um, professional development related stuff. And um, Jen is, Jen's is there as well at JWetham SBCTC. She uses it for um, her ATL information. So um, just wrapping up, we always like to um, hear what you thought. And this is a link to a SurveyMonkey um, evaluation that Jennifer has prepared for us. And I'm pasting that into the chat again. Uh, please go ahead and just click that link and give us just a few seconds of your time to tell us how we can improve. And be sure to give us specific feedback so that we can learn and grow. Um, and we love to hear that good stuff too. So um, thank you for joining us. And I think that was the last slide, Jen. Yeah. Oh, and oh wait, 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 wait. Sorry. You can do this. You can oh, do this. Um, and yeah, and before, but just as people are leaving, I just wanted to say thank you to Allison and thank you to Alyssa for all her hard work in preparing these beautiful slides. Allison. You were fantastic. And if people could just, if people are typing in thank you. So I think it's always nice if people just write in and say thanks to Allison. Let's give her a shout out. Give her some, you know, some applause and some smiley faces. Um, and I see, oh, I, whoa, people are, oh, people are raising their hands. <laughs> um, so thank you so much. And uh, February 19th, um, Janet Hinson is going to present on using position stands in a variety of, um, it's a, it's, she teaches health sciences, but it can be used in a variety of different environments. Dynamic student-centered dialogue-based synthesis. It's going, she's dynamic and exciting. It's going to be really fun. And so. it's going to be an experiment. <laughs> yeah, we're going we're gonna to experiment with the breakout rooms. So you'll all learn a lot about uh, collaborate from participating. So thanks, everyone, for being such a great audience. Allison, Alyssa, always a pleasure to work with you both. And uh, till next time, everyone. Thank you again to Rod for joining us and Amber. Yes, Rod and Amber, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm